now on News Talk 105.9 WMAL. O'Connor and Company. It is 6.06 here on this Monday morning. It's Larry O'Connor. I'm back. Yes, I'm back. It's 17th day of July. Thank you to Vince Colonnese and Michael Palka and Derek Hunter for filling in while I was gone. Two weeks with Young America's Foundation on a a great European cruise, and I am uh, so excited to be back here. Uh, And for all the new friends that we met on the cruise who are now listening and streaming all over the country who are all back in, uh, good morning. Good to talk with you again. I'm Larry O'Connor alongside Julie Gunlock. Julie, did you miss me, Julie? Of course. Long two weeks, but... Say it like you're not paid to. (laughs) Coming up at 7.05, Joe DeGeneva will join us at 8.35. Link Lauren, who is a uh, culture critic and commentator on TikTok. Interesting. Uh, TikTok, yeah. people have a a good voice out there on some things. Yeah, I just, they do. I do want to destroy the platform they're Me on. Me too. Though. Yeah, okay. Joining us right now is Michelle Evans. She's a chapter leader at the uh, Mighty Independent Women's Network in Round Rock. Michelle, where's Round Rock? Is that... You're out in Arizona. It's a, it's a suburb north of Austin, Texas. Oh, in ah. Austin, Texas. Okay. Well, thanks for waking up so early for us. <laughs> Dang. I am a early morning person, so this is perfect. All right. Well, listen. Uh, so you're setting up an event here as the great these great events and these great forums that Independent Women's Network and Independent Women's Forum have been able to mobilize and do regionally, specifically about. Uh, speaking to the people in your community about protecting women and girls in their private spaces. That's that's what this is, event is all about? Yes, it's a really simple event. It's just women gathering in the public square with a mic and a PA to speak openly about um, the need for protection of women's sex-based rights. And, and yeah, it sounds perfectly normal. And certainly in the Austin area where you get, you know, you've got political activists who are constantly taken to the public square – to talk about, you know, all all color and shape of political ideologies and political perspectives. This seems like a very simple one. And now they're trying to they're trying to cancel you. Yes. So we put um, the event on Eventbrite to try to sell some tickets. Like I said, it is the public square, so it is open to the public. But we needed to raise some funds to pay for travel expenses and, of course, security because these events in the past, um, these Let Women Speak events, have turned violent in cities like Portland, uh, New York City, and and New Zealand recently. So we were trying to um, raise some funds through Eventbrite, and on um, last week they emailed me, their trust and safety experts emailed me and said that the listing was taken down for violating their um, policy on hateful, dangerous, or violent content and events. Hateful, dangerous, yeah, hateful. And violent. It's interesting. Eventbrite is is owned. Um, Michelle is owned by a woman. Um, yes. I find this fascinating. So, Eventbrite then takes down your event, uh, takes it off the yes. website. You get this notification. Um, and you've tried to fight back. You have reached out to them. Has there been any subsequent messages There's from Eventbrite? Zero response from Eventbrite, either um, from the letter that was sent, the press release that was sent, or even before that, the 2 million plus views on Twitter that um, my post got, and it was mm-hmm. subsequent subsequently retweeted by people including Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan. Um, But yeah, it's been radio silence from them. And and just to be clear, the way that the the event was advertised on uh, Eventbrite said nothing in terms of political leanings. It said nothing in terms of actions being taken. None of that. It was just simply women gathering in the public square to talk about sex-based rights. And, you know, and I, I get invited to a lot of different speaking engagements or, or you know, get togethers around the D.C. area. And a lot of conservative groups, Republican groups, they use Eventbrite. It's a very powerful app mm-hmm. engine and a device to be able to accommodate large groups, do RSVPs, coordinate it all. And basically they're just saying that, you know, again, the name of your your 
uh, event here is let women is speak. Is let women, women speak. speak. So yeah. yeah. And again, <laughs> yeah. Julia Hart. And they're not Hart, interested in letting you speak. And again, Julia Hart is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Event, right? So she is shutting women down, telling women that they mm-hmm. can't speak. And this is a significant issue uh, you know, for IWN, you're a chapter leader, mm-hmm. um, and you know our organization is really involved in this issue about how men are biological men are increasingly entering women's spaces, whether it be prisons, locker rooms, spas. Um, we are seeing this, and so this is something many women are concerned about. And you simply wanted to give a voice to this issue, isn't that right? Yes, I, I want to bring in some preeminent activists from across the state and across the country and the globe to talk about this issue because it's it's silenced all throughout Austin. There is no opinion, no platform given to women who want to push back on the idea that men who identify as women will be allowed then access to our bathrooms, changing rooms. You know, in yeah. my school district a couple of years ago, there was quite a controversy because um, girls in high school were told that they needed to go change at home or bring a pop-up tent if they wanted to change in the women's locker room if they felt intimidated by the presence of a biological boy in that space. So this has been going on for a couple of years. Those are, and, and those are for school-aged girls that if, if they're correct. uncomfortable being exposed to a naked man's anatomy, they right. need to accommodate. They're the problem. Correct. And the, the, the boys' parents even said, we will not use, we will not have him use the single stall restroom because that's discrimination against him. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they said them or, or <laughs> her in that case. Uh, and let's just yeah. be clear here. So Eventbrite, Eventbrite has taken your event down in Austin mm-hmm. specifically because it it violates their terms of service with hateful, dangerous, or violent language. They're okay with a 14-year-old girl being exposed to a naked man against their consent, against their will. Or for that matter, right. a 25-year-old. I mean, I always, I always use the 14-year-old girl because I think that it shocks mm-hmm. the system. But I'm sorry. I know I'm old fashioned. I don't think a 23 year old young woman or a 42 year old woman, young woman, should be uh, should have to undress or or have a man undress in front of them without their consent. I, I last I checked, I thought consent was a big thing, but that idea is not against Eventbrite's policies against hateful, right, dangerous, right. or violent language. So I, I mean, so what are you doing now? How are you? Obviously, we're in D.C. We're trying to raise awareness for this because I'm sure it's going on everywhere. But how's the event looking now for you in Austin? Do you have an alternate way to make sure that you can account for, I, I would think is going to be a pretty good turnout? We have a give, send, go. Um, I think these days they're the, the most reliable platform as far as crowdsourcing and crowdfunding is concerned. Um, I have a, a different um, donation platform on there because in May at the Texas Capitol, a man came into the women's restroom. I called him out on Twitter I'm now um, under active criminal investigation right. for that. That's right. Yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole nother so, show. And, then, and this is yeah, in Texas. This is in Texas. Yeah, yes. She's being this investigated in... for taking a picture of a male in a woman's bathroom. See, but that well, county, Austin. The they... Oh, you didn't take the picture. I'm yeah. sorry. But you put, you put no, it on. No. Yeah. Um, on Twitter. Well, That's Michelle right. Evans is the chapter leader there at Independent Women's Network Round Rock, which is in the Austin vicinity. And I mean, Julie, I know how proud you are of women like Michelle who have jumped in and started their own Independent Women's Network where they live. Anyone in the sound of our voice can do the same thing where they are and they can be a word. Because mm-hmm. this is a fight. This is what's needed right now. That's right. That's right. Michelle, thanks so much. Fight. Thank you very much. Good luck. Let, let us know how the event goes. Of course. It is 6.15. Making sense of the news. Live from the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. The new WMAL app has arrived. Download it today and listen anywhere in the world. You know, when you think of a national union leader for the teachers union who is unhinged, completely insane, and is uh, single-handedly trying to destroy education in this country, you immediately think, of course, of Randy Weingarten, right? <laughs> right. 
Randy Weingarten, who is uh, she's the president of the American Federation for Teachers, right? Yes. Uh, and so it's like, wow, it can't get any worse than Randy Weingarten. Well, may I introduce to you uh, Rebecca Pringle. Becky Pringle. Becky Pringle. Mm-hmm. Becky Pringle is the president of the National Education Association, which actually I think is larger. It is larger, yes. Than the American Federation Randy's for Teachers. Randy's just much more sort of in the media, but this Becky Pringle, whew. Well, and, and Randy's also very much, she's a lobbyist, basically. She's politically yes. connected. Yes. She's, She's Jill's she doesn't best have friend. Anything to do with teachers, right. right? She's Joe and Jill's best friend. Yes, she is the best friend of the Democratic Party. She has one job, and that is to push a political agenda right. on behalf of the Democratic Party that oftentimes is at odds with the sensibilities, values, or principles of those teachers. That's why, before I introduce you now to Becky Pringle, if you are a teacher, and we know that you're listening to us right now, so you are sensible, and you don't like being led by people like Randy Weingarten or uh, Ms. Pringle, who you need to know that you can pull out your you. You don't have to pay dues yeah, to these people. Don't. The Janus decision has has made it so that any public employee does not have to pay their dues to an organization or to a union that does not represent them. That's right. right? That's right. Also, just a warning: what you're about to hear is very um, yeah. Maybe with the volume, just I'm, a little. I don't want to trigger anyone, yeah, but it's, it's like we used to have to do this. Whenever we play Hillary Clinton, we always had to say just some warning. Trigger warning. Trigger yeah. warning. So here's your president of the National Education Association. She represents you, teach. I, I keep hearing from teachers, oh, they don't yeah. represent us. Yeah. We're we're different. We're not. Okay, well, she does Walk represent away. you. Walk away. Chief Seattle crying out to us, urging us to remember when you know who you are, when your mission is clear and you burn with the inner fire of an unbreakable will, no cold can touch your heart. No deluge can dampen your purpose. And yay, you are those stars in the darkness. Your light will not be dimmed. Your purpose will drive you in a righteous fight for freedom because you know who you are. There's more. Oh, there's more. And I'm going to play more, but I just want to pause for a moment because the visual is very important, too. And we'll put this out on our social media so you can see the video. Remember when, you know, people like Jennifer Rubin and David French would often analyze President Trump's speeches at his rallies. This is quintessential Mussolini. This is how fascists behave with their (laughs) frothing, you know, uh, stormtrooper. You got to see this Uh, one because this is and I don't do this very often, only when it's appropriate. This is Hitler esque. Oh, it in is. The, the 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 hand motions, the oh. body language, the there's the also clenched fists, and there's this tent revival kind of just passion coming from not really passion. It's the wrong word. It's like insanity. Yeah, and you know we are a less religious people. It's because this is what's replacing religion. This is yeah, this is a cult. Right. This is religion. This is really. Bizarre stuff. And let me be clear, as I let you hear the rest of this this unhinged rant from the president of the National Education Association speaking to the assembled body there of union teachers, what she's talking about, mm-hmm. you know, what this is really all about is is protecting or standing by the radical behavior of teachers. Yes. And their behavior in the classroom that goes beyond what you, the people, you, the parent, you, the taxpayer, have allowed to happen in the classroom. And she said, oh, hell no, we're not going to listen to those people. You put whatever books you want on the shelf. Yes. You talk about whatever you want to talk about, your personal relationships and your personal. That's what she's so passionate about. And that's what they're screaming and applauding about. for the rights of education professionals and we will change this world for our students with that inner fire burning we will never bend we will never be broken because we are the NEA and we will always always do what we must to be worthy of our students Thank you, NEA, for all you do every day for our babies and for our colleagues.
weeks our, and our babies. for your states and for this country. Onward, NEA. Onward. You know, when they tell you who they are and show you who they are, believe them. Yeah. Are you is... paying attention? Do you get it? Do you know what time it is? I think you do. It's 622. All right, coming up, quite a bit happened over the weekend with regard to the presidential race 2024. There was that whole Blaze-sponsored event that Tucker Carlson hosted, uh, and a Vivek Ramaswamy star seems to be rising. You probably heard him here first, and we'll give you an update on all that stuff coming up. WMALFM Woodbridge, Washington, a cumulus media station. Making sense of the news. News Talk 105.9. News now. Now. On News Talk 1.9 WMAL. O'Connor and Company. On the NEA, our mission is clear. We will advocate for the rights of education professionals. And we will change this world for our students with that inner fire burning. We will For those of you reacting to the audio that we played of the president of the National Education Association and wondering if we were actually giving a live feed from an exorcism, (laughs) you uh, you were close. Yeah, that's that's who's representing your teachers right now. Teachers, why are you letting her represent you? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. My friend Elizabeth wrote me and said, "Um, that's a lot in the morning. That is a whole lot. Sorry. (laughs) Welcome back. It's O'Connor and Company here. Larry O'Connor with Julie Gunlock. And coming up at 705 Joe DeGeneva and 835 Link Lauren. Uh, Let's get you up to speed now on a whole lot going on with the the presidential campaign. So uh, uh, Tucker Carlson was asked to uh, be the MC or or chief inquisitor at uh, an event. On Friday, and this is set up by Glenn Beck at the Blaze, along with the Leadership Institute and a couple of other great organizations. It was in Iowa, and basically Tucker had about 20, 25 minutes one-on-one which, with each of the candidates, yeah. basically. At least the candidates that showed up. Uh, President Trump did not show up. which he did not. Which I, 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 I mean, I guess the strategy of the Trump campaign right now is it's been kind of threefold. The first is he thinks that he's just entitled to be the nominee yeah. because and by, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. No, no, no. Yeah, they I have said it. that. Yeah. They have said, listen, he was the president. He's an he got, he got yep. it right. He's running as an incumbent and he shouldn't be challenged at this level like this. They should, you know, people should defer to him. Everyone else has their chance next yep. time around. Um, number one, number two, I think that he believes early on right now in the campaign that if he attends these events, he basically is elevating everybody else to his mm-hmm. level. He is trouncing everyone in the polls. Yeah. He is trouncing everyone in fundraising. He's trouncing everyone in coverage. Yeah. Why should he do something like this this early on in the uh, in the campaign right. to do, do nothing but help all these other people? And that brings us to the third, which is it can only hurt him. If he has a bad moment, if he gives a bad answer, if he does, it's like, you know, why why do an unforced error now if you don't have to, right? So I get it. Politically, that does make sense. I just, me personally, I think that everybody should participate in these things because that's what our American system is all about. Yeah. That's just me. But I, I but, agree. But I'm not a politician or a political I I, I I totally agree with your calculus, and I do think that he thinks he can be choosy now. Yeah, and guess what? He can. Yeah. He can be choosy. Um, he had an opportunity to see Asa Hutchison, so I don't know why <laughs> he skipped it. Ace of Fever might be over. Asa did not fare well. No, he did not. He in got the booed. Tucker Carlson one on one. Well, uh, well, he not only did he get uh, have a problem with Tucker Carlson in the one on one, but then I don't know if he got booed at that, but he did get booed at the at some point um, Turning booed. Point USA. There was a clip, and I'm not sure it was yeah, the that, same. Yeah, that thing, was but... a Charlie Kirk's thing that oh, he does okay. down in West Palm Beach. Ah. By the way, and to be you know equal time and equally fair, Ron DeSantis did not show up mm. to the Charlie Kirk affair down in West Palm Beach, Florida. Now, again, politically, I get it. He's like, okay, it's Charlie Kirk. It's you know, and the lineup was you know Trump, Bannon, Bongino, right, right. <laughs> Carrie Lake. It's yeah. like you know, it's like a Trump rally, right? Um, and it's in West Palm Beach, Florida, right? But Ron DeSantis needs to be able to deal with that. Ron DeSantis needs to walk into that room 
and explain to all those voters why he's the right choice right, right now, that's even right. if they boo him, even if they're it's heavy to Trump. Because guess what? Ron DeSantis ain't going anywhere unless he can convince Trump voters to vote for him. That's right. And where do you go to do that? You go to an event like that. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I have hostility for both of them for not showing up to events right now, because that's what this is all about. Um, I shouldn't say hostility, but I'm 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 disappointed. Can I say that? Yeah, mm-hmm. you can. And I'm sure they're gonna. It's really gonna lose. They're gonna lose sleep over that. Oh no, Larry's disappointed. All right. So so I thought it was enlightening. I thought Tim Scott came across pretty good as he often does now in the one on ones with Tucker. Vivek Ramaswamy really mobbed. turned some heads. He got mobbed. He got mobbed at both events. Yeah. And his responses to Tucker were fantastic, especially uh, when he was asked about. Uh, when he was asked about January 6th and, you know, Tucker presented it in such of, you know, we keep hearing all these things about January 6th and, you know, maybe it wasn't an insurrection. Maybe there was something else going on there because there's just some things you're not allowed to talk, you know, in, in Tucker's um, inimitable fashion. Right. And his answer, Vivek Ramaswamy's answer was uh, pretty amazing, actually, if you if you listen to it. Let me let me pull it up here so you can hear part of it. What caused January 6th is pervasive censorship in this country in the lead up to January 6th. You tell people in this country they cannot speak, that is when they scream. You tell people they cannot scream, that is when they tear things down. And so the reality is we were told that you could not question where the virus came from when we all knew it came from a lab in Wuhan, which now they admit. We were told that you could not send a private message to someone on the eve of an election that Hunter Biden's laptop story was actually a true story worth considering before an election. You were systematically suppressed. So this is, think about this. You told you had to be locked down, had to take a vaccine that was mandated and forced down your throat, stay locked down in your home while Antifa and BLM roam and burn the streets of this country. So that's the lead up of one full year of telling people you have to shut up, sit down and do as you're told. And then you tell them, okay, there's an election where you didn't get the information that you needed, such as the Hunter Biden laptop story being real and suppressed. That's what caused January 6th, is a cycle of censorship in this country. And until we look ourselves in the mirror and admit truth on that, we will not move forward as a country. And I think that's the real cause. And we're not, and I'm sorry to say. Uh, I think that was a fascinating answer yeah and i think there's a whole lot of truth there now i know that that you know blm and liberal groups can say oh he's you know advocating violence right like of course, of course black lives matters they, they were told they were not oh are you kidding me activist race baiting oh, activists had, had, had never been told to shut up they've never, never been they've told loved it they're not are you kidding me i mean every every political figure on the left took a knee right you know joined they were in the marginalized oh, they had every please. power in the world and they still burn and they things and blm down. the leader of blm now owns like seven houses and is like a billionaire <laughs> exactly. give me a break i think that was a fascinating response and i think it's one that uh somebody who does not have a whole lot of political baggage like vivek ramaswamy can yeah. actually carry off that said, Mike Pence, Asa Hutchinson, not so good at this event. We'll give you some of those details in a moment. And a great moment of Tucker Carlson at this Charlie Kirk. All right, continuing now covering uh, what happened on Friday. Uh, t- again, Tucker Carlson was the host of this summit uh, that was sponsored by the Blaze. Here's the moment with Vice President Pence that's gotten a lot of attention. And uh, Tucker is making the case that you know, M- Mike Pence, one of the lanes that he's trying to fill here is national security and a very robust uh, uh, build up or assistance to Ukraine for their military build up, and his criticism of Biden is that Biden hasn't done enough, haven't given them enough lethal uh, weapons to be able to stop the Putin invasion. So here's this exchange that's getting a lot of attention. Over the past three years, yeah. drive around. There's not one city that's gotten better in the United States, right. and it's visible. Our economy has degraded. The suicide rate has jumped. Public filth and disorder and crime have exponentially increased, and yet your concern is that the Ukrainians, a country most people can't find on a map, who've received tens of billions of U.S. tax dollars, don't have enough tanks. I think it's a fair question to ask, like, where's the concern for the United States in that? Well, it's not my concern. (laughs) Tucker, I've heard that routine from you before, but that's not my concern. All right, so... 
it sounds like Vice President Pence is saying that he's not concerned about American cities. He's not. He said that's not my concern. No, he doesn't mean it that way. But yeah. he didn't. That, so if you listen again to what Tucker asked, he said your. He said to Mike Pence, your concern is that Ukraine doesn't have enough tanks. And then he goes on and says, "Where's your concern for Americans?" And I think what Pence was saying was, yes, it's, "It's not my concern." He, that you he can... should have said, "You've characterized it incorrectly," right. yeah. or "You've characterized my concerns incorrectly." Mm. Instead, he said. That's not, not my, my concern. Let me play it for you again, Ro, this part. Of and it. yet your concern is that the Ukrainians, a country most people can't find on a map, who've received tens of billions of U.S. tax dollars, don't have enough tanks. Right. I think it's a fair question to ask, like, where's the concern for the United States in that? Well, it's not my concern. All right. So, yeah, it, so again, it was spun as him not being concerned about America. Right. Which, But here's the thing. It's easy to do that. Mm-hmm. It's it's very easy to hear that and say, oh my gosh, he's saying he's not concerned because it was it was not a good look. Uh, it wasn't the right way to respond to that. I don't think um, you mentioned I, earlier Trump maybe didn't Trump didn't go because you know he could say something. I mean, this is exactly it's a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that said, I don't know if Tucker necessarily would have um, been questioning oh, Trump yeah. quite as aggressively on We're Ukraine. We're just saying that it's very easy for right. these to be spun. That said, Pence looked awful. He looked defensive. He looked angry. He looked stubborn. He looked uh, entrenched. And and it doesn't matter that he in artfully responded there. Either way, it was a bad look for Pence. And then compound it with that. And I just, it's, it's... What's fascinating to me is I've watched Pence on unfriendly media interviews, doing unfriendly media interviews. Mm-hmm. He looks much more comfortable. Yeah. Because he's always trying to sort of kindly appeal to them their reasonable side and he's you know always calm and gentle um he and and he, he looked very uncomfortable in this situation i i like my pants always have i don't know if this is his time and i gotta tell you um my he's he's got a lot of work to do um for the, at the debate coming up to sort of fix this issue Mm. Um, I don't think he's getting a whole lot of grassroots small donors. I think he's got a lot of big money behind him right now. Um, traditional Republican donors, the kind that uh, fueled the Romney campaign. Um, not grassroots activism, not the people on the streets, not on Main Street. And in watching this, and I again, I like Pence. And my reaction was, oh, he's not even trying to win. His, his, his goal here isn't to win the election. His goal is to recraft the rest of his career, his rest of his future. And he knows he's not going to, at this point, be sort of the favorite of the Trump populist activist Republican groups right, right now. Right. His lane for a future career is sort of the uh, university president. Yeah. Book deals. AEI. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, Manhattan Institute. Yep. It's yep. that kind of thing. Yep. And by maintaining this position and sort of being, you know, in some way in opposition to to Tucker's po- politics, that's his that's his lane. All right, fine. But that's not how you win the Republican nomination. No. Not not we're done. Not in twenty. 20-